Um, maybe if anybody could come up with any questions uh, since um, the first session ended. Now would be a good time to ask before we maybe go to the hands-on session. So you have to uh, check on Slack myself. Um, okay, so there was a question already here that was, I think, answered. Okay. Anything else? Anything about the theory? If not, let's start the hands-on session. Okay. Um, um, so for this hands-on session, uh, we will consider, uh, so we won't be doing PCA because it's a very simple problem without uh, module observables. It's just one observable. But we will go through uh, the Gaussian process emulation and the MCMC for posterior sampling. Okay. Um, so the first thing is, uh, I wonder if, all of you have access to uh, this notebook. Sorry. Let me just, uh, in case. Okay, so this is the GitHub link. Um, so I think maybe I can just get started. Okay, so as I just mentioned, in this notebook, we won't be covering our uh, uh, PCA components, but we will do uh, Bayesian inference using Gaussian process for underlying model. Okay, uh, so let's just recap again the Bayesian inference parts. Um, this is our base formula, uh, base rule, sorry. Um, and because we are only interested in the parameter estimation, we can um, get rid of this uh, so-called normalizing constant and just consider solving this proportionality problem. Okay, so in this notebook, we'll be using a very simple simulator, a linear model. So we assume there's a linear relationship between the model parameter, uh, theta, and the output variable, y, and the simulation model uh, is given in this lean model in the code below. But let me just go through a few uh, notes here. <laughs> and uh, we are using a linear model in this notebook because it's not computationally demanding. So we can focus on the concepts of Bayesian inference and emulation. But keep in mind, in reality, you have a realistic physics model, which can be very complicated, nonlinear, and slow to run. OK. So on top of our linear model, um, we add in some statistical noise. Um, this is the epsilon here. So this is our uh, linear model. Y equals m times theta plus b plus epsilon. Um, so we have our uh, parameter of interest, theta, um, and also our uh, slope, m intercept b, and uh, statistical error, epsilon. <laughs> OK, so uh, now some. Uh, so feel free to uh, follow along with the coding here. The first step is just to import some libraries. And I hope you have all installed uh, this GPy and some other libraries. If there's any question, please feel free to post on Slack or on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm assuming there's no question for importing the libraries. And the next step is to define our simulator. Let's zoom in a bit. OK, so uh, we said we want to add in some st statistical error here. So we have our noise level to be set as 0.01. For now. <laughs> and then uh, this is our model, lean model. Um, although it has four arguments, uh, theta, intercept, slope, and noise, uh, the last three uh, arguments are just fixed. So the only uh, changing variable here is the theta. So for now, I'm just using uh, the intercept to be 0 0.12, slope to be minus 0 0.25, and noise level, um, you may tune later on just to see uh, what's the uh, impact of the noise. Um, so this defines our linear model, um, intercept, slope, and variables. Um, we also add in this uh, Gaussian noise, this normal noise, as our statistical error. 
and uh, the model returns the uh, simulation outputs and its uncertainty for visualization. Okay, so let's run this code chunk. Okay, so once we have this simulator, um, okay, so this simulator is not slow, but in reality, it can be slow. So we want to build a model emulator using Gaussian process. Okay, um, so before we train our Gaussian process, we will need to generate some data, uh, this so-called uh, training data. Um, and the training data consists of two part, two components the input parameters and the simulation outputs. So we first generate uh, the simulation data, the input parameters in this code chunk. So basically what it does is first we specify how many uh, design points we want. So design points are the input parameters we need to run our simulator. So we need uh, 20 points. Um, and this two line just specifies the range of the parameters. So it's between zero and uh, this expression. And then we, uh, because this is just a one dimensional input parameter, we can ju just generate a uh, regular grid on this domain using uh, 20 points. So that's this model X. Um, so the next step is to run the simulator using this model X. And then we have our uh, simulator outputs and the simulator uncertainty. This is the figure uh, visualizing uh, both the inputs and the outputs as well as the uncertainty. So we see it follows uh, basically on a linear linear uh, linear model. It's a uh, it's a line, but there are also some scatters around each uh, output observables. So those are coming from our statist statistical error. Okay, um, so there are also some exercises you may try to answer. Um, does this look like a linear model produced the data, um, which I think it, it is? Um, you can also play around with the amount of noise in the data. For example, we may change this to 0 0.1 and see what will happen. Okay, now you can not see the linear model because the now the noise is just huge. So for the modeling purpose, let me just re reduce the noise to be the original level. But you can always just play around to see um, what's the impact of uh, experimental noise, uh, of the uh, statistical noise in the, uh, in the simulator model. <coughs> okay, so the second section is we want to train a Gaussian process on this uh, data. Um, here are some uh, useful notes about Gaussian process, especially uh, this one. So this one allows you to, um, okay, so this is the visualization I showed just now. Um, so you can play around and see uh, what this Gaussian pro process does. Uh, and then it also has a lot of um, different kernels you can play with, like changing the uh, covariance matrix and see what's the, um, how does it affect our Gaussian process. So feel free to explore um, these links if you are interested. Okay, um, so in order to train a Gaussian process, um, so we know we have uh, two components in uh, two ingredients of the Gaussian process, the mean function and the covariance function. Um, so here we first specify the covariance function. Um, in the library, it's called kernels. Um, the covariance function is just a kernel uh, to choose. So here we choose our kernel to be a squared exponential kernel and a white noise kernel. White noise kernel is just a Gaussian noise. <laughs> okay, so here uh, the first thing we specify is the, um, this is just a guess of the possible variation of the parameters. Um, like uh, it's the guess of the parameters in the squared exponential kernel. Um, you can, uh, if you have some information about uh, what's the 
hyperparameters should be, you can just input in the kernel specification. But if not, maybe um, just use, just specify how many dimensions you have should be sufficient. <coughs> um, so this RBF kernel is the uh, commonly used squared exponential kernel. Um, so apart from this RBF kernel, we also consider using a white noise kernel. So that's because we have a statistical error in our simulator. And the uh, uh, function is called uh, GPI kern white. Okay, so our uh, final kernel to use is the combination of the squared exponential kernel and a white noise kernel. So we just sum them up to be, uh, so we call this kernel my kernel. Okay, so that's for specifying the kernel function, the covariance function. So now we deal with the uh, main function. Um, so like many uh, machine learning methods, um, sometimes the performance of the model uh, depend on the scale of your data. So a uh, uh, good practice is to first scale our outputs to the unit range using the standard scalar um, in a uh, uh, Python library. Um, so this three lines is just to perform a standard scalar transformation on the, the outputs. So the uh, scaled model outputs will be a zero mean and univariance. Let's just check. And P dot P. Yeah, it's very close to zero. And the variance is just one. Okay, so now we can train our Gaussian process on the uh, simulator model, the linear model calculations. The way to do so is to call this function uh, GP regression from our uh, GPI library. So it has three arguments. The first argument is your input parameter model X. Um, the second argument is the output, uh, which is the scaled output uh, we generated here. And the last argument um, is the kernel you want to specify for the Gaussian process regression. So once uh, you set this model, uh, this MyGP model, just call uh, optimize uh, function to estimate the hyperparameters. <laughs> Here is just printing out uh, the output of MyGP after the op optimization. So this optimization basically uh, does is to find the best values of all these parameters, which gives the highest likelihood uh, of the Gaussian process. So you can just take a look at, at uh, all the values and see whether uh, they look reasonable or not. Usually if you see a very large variance or a very a huge um, land scale, very small land scale, there might be something going on need to check the whether the GP performs better, uh, performs well or not. Okay. Um, so now, now that we have our uh, basic Gaussian process model, we now consider using the Gaussian model, the Gaussian process model to do prediction. We call this function mu predict. So it takes in the argument, only one argument is the input parameter, the theta. And then it first performs Gaussian process prediction. Uh, but recall our uh, Gaussian process is built on scaled data. So we want to scale it, uh, rescale it back to the original parameter space. So that's what uh, the last four lines is doing. So we scale uh, the, the, both the outputs uh, both the prediction and the uncertainty to the original scale. Yeah, so feel free to uh, running and to follow along and run this code to see if there's any bugs, any errors, and just let me know. <laughs> um, Irene, should we uh, try to get some feedback, uh, like uh, like thumbs up or so from people if they are doing well, uh... or if they maybe you need to. Yeah, but the thing is, I cannot see the thumbs ups when sharing the screen. Yeah, no, uh, I think I can see them in the, okay, I think I can see them if uh, participants do that. 
Um, so participants, if you want to uh, show that you've been following along and uh, everything is sort of uh, going okay, is there, I hope everybody has a thumbs up uh, as a reaction. Let me see. Yes, so some do. Of, yes, so. Oh, there's also there's also a poll that's coming. There's a poll. I, yeah. I don't know who which one of us is setting that up. Is that <laughs> is that Chun that's doing that or? Yeah, I can do a poll if you want. Uh, but I think right now we're basically just using the green check mark. Uh, well, the green check mark. Yeah, I got three okay. green check marks so far out of thirty nine people online. So. So if you're not ready to give a green check mark because you're stuck somewhere, feel free to um, ask for help in mm -hmm. Slack or in the chat. Yep. Okay, we're up to six green check marks. Okay, um, maybe we just pause for a minute and give people yeah. to the we chance. Us to we usually, yeah, we usually like to get at least a double digit check mark tally. <laughs> Oh, okay, up to seven. If you need more time, you can hit an you can hit an X, and we'll and we'll at least know to wait. And as I said, if something doesn't work as expected, uh, post on Slack. All right. Okay. I like the I like the confounded symbol. If you need more mm -hmm. time, we started early, so we can. Uh, it's okay to pause. Uh, yeah. I don't know who did the confounded symbol, but uh, if there's anything you think uh, the instructors can do or the TAs, please post. Yeah. Yeah. That was me. I was testing it. Oh. Oh. You. <laughs> How can I help you, Ron? I was looking for something appropriate. I'm, I've solved my problem now that I've discovered the symbol. Okay. Okay, we're up to eight green dots. Let's wait for a few more. I suppose everybody can see the green dots though, right? Uh, Ron, you see the green dots as well? Yeah, yeah uh, yes. Yeah, okay. All right, nine. <laughs> 10, okay. 12, all right. Okay, so people are catching up, that's great. Okay, give it another minute and then I think we're ready to move on. 13, 14, okay, cool. Very good. And then uh, just a reminder to folks, if you're having any trouble, uh, please go to Slack and, and type up your problem because there are, uh, we have TAs online who will continue to work with you even, even as we restart the, the, the session.
Yeah, so don't feel shy to post on Slack. Yeah, ch ch chances are if you're having an issue, there's at least one or two other people out there having exactly the same issue. Okay, is 15 a good number? Should we uh, move on? It's about, I guess, uh, 38 minus all the Jetscape people in here, we probably about half the people now have a green dot. Yeah, I think I think that's good, Reiner. Yeah. Okay, so then Irene, would you please continue? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so after we uh, fitted our Gaussian process emulator and uh, defined our prediction, uh, prediction function, we can now check how well our emulator fits the, uh, the simulator. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to check is the just a visualization of the predictions. Um, so we first make a grid of our, um, just to plot the uh, predictions, uh, 100 points and perform prediction on this 100 points and then uh, visualize the predictions as far as the training data together using, uh, so our predictive mean in red, um, our one sigma band and two sigma bands uh, of the predictions plus or minus uncertainty in uh, purple and in orange. And also the, or, uh, the original training data uploaded here as well. So we can visualize the, just how well our prediction performs. Um, so I think it performs okay because um, the two sigma bands are all covered, uh, have already covered the training data here. <laughs> Okay, and then just some exercise you may uh, try to do afterwards, like changing the number of design points. Uh, now we are using 20. You can see if uh, 10 points is sufficient or if 30 points will give you a better fit. Um, and you may increase or decrease the model error, which is the, the noise level uh, in the previous code, code chunks and see whether this will affect our uh, GP performance. Okay, um, so this is just a visualization of the predictions. We can also try to uh, do some real tests, like generating a testing set uh, to do both prediction and to run the simulator to see whether the truth uh, and the predictions are in line with each other. <laughs> so we do so as follows. Um, so now we, also, we still want 100 points, but this is for a novel testing set. The way we generate the static testing set is to use uh, is to draw a uniform distribution from this uh, mean and max range, and then first run the simulator and call our model uh, call the output model y test, and the second run the prediction and call the predictions g p y test. Uh, so they both have uncertainties. And here's a visualization of the predictions versus the truth. Um, this is this diagonal line is the perfect line. So if all points fall on this line, it means a, it's a perfect fit. But of course, we cannot achieve that. Um, so how do we look at this figure is to first see whether all the points are clustered around this diagonal line. So I think it does. Um, and because of this uh, uncertainty for both the simulator outputs and also the prediction outputs, you, uh, the figure might look a bit ugly, but we can still say all the points are close to this diagonal line, meaning the model can fit the simulator, the emulator can fit the simulator uh, good enough. <laughs> okay, um, so the last thing we want to validate is using the residuals. So the residuals is the difference between uh, predictions and the truth. Um, so we can just uh, compute the residual and uh, draw the scatter plot and draw the histogram. Um, so if we don't see um, any pattern of the residuals in the scatter plots, um, they are all just uh, uniformly distributed around zero. And if we don't see any uh, weird pattern for the histogram, like here they just look quite normally distributed around zero, um, we think that Fitted results should be uh, reasonable. 
So there are also some other uh, plots and testings you may perform, like the quantile quantile plots, specifically to check whether this uh, distribution of residuals follow a normal distribution. But you can explore all those tests uh, on your own. Uh, there are a lot of uh, material online. <laughs> okay, so before we go into this Bayesian inference, uh, is there any questions for the first part of the hands-on session? Okay, I see a lot of green checks, so maybe we can continue. Um, so the performing the Bayesian inference um, is like sampling from this proportionality uh, expression. <coughs> so uh, this expression has two ingredients, the likelihood and the prior. So let's look at the prior first, P theta. Um, in this notebook, we'll be using um, two different priors. The first prior is just a flat prior, meaning we give a range for the theta and just assume everything to be the same. And the second prior is called a picked prior, um, which means that theta is centered uh, within uh, around some value and it's more likely to be within a certain range with uh, close to that value. Okay. <laughs> um, so here are some codes to define the log, uh, a flat prior and the pick prior. Okay, so this is the visualization of the uh, flat prior and the pick prior. So we see uh, for the flat prior, um, it's uniform from zero to 0 0.3. And for the pick prior, um, it's centered around 0 0.15 and the spread is much smaller than the flat prior. So for the pick prior, it's like, um, prior to, uh, before observing any data, <coughs> we think the true value of theta is around 0 0.15, and we don't think it's uh, likely to be on the boundary from zero to uh, at zero or at 0 0.3. Okay, so the next function we want to de define is our likelihood. Um, so here we are assuming um, the our experimental data. Uh, uh, our uh, experimental data follows a normal distribution, meaning it's there are some uh, Gaussian noise on the experimental data. So basically, this function uh, this function is trying to model this part of our our posterior distribution. Uh, so we have our prediction eta hat. Uh, we also have our uh, 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 the, the, this is the uncertainty, which integrates both the experimental the experimental noise and the predictive uncertainty. <laughs> so that's basically uh, the three line code here. Um, we have our uh, we have three arguments. The first argument is the input parameter, which can be changed, and the other two arguments are fixed. One is the experimental data, and the other is the experimental data uncertainty. Um, so one thing to take note here is instead of using um, experimental data from Y1 to Yn, um, here in our simplified notebook, we are just using one point, uh, which is the mean, and one uncertainty. Uh, so we don't have the sum of different uh, over different experimental data points. We just have one. Okay, so uh, why does the total uncertainty in the likelihood have this expression? So this is answered here because we need to account for um, our em emulator uncertainty. So we have this expression in our uh, sigma square, sigma two. Okay. Let me just check the green checks. Okay. I think, um, I think maybe we have to ask everybody to sort of reset first. Uh, so if you're if you're not in a green state, maybe you <laughs> get rid of the green. And if you are okay and have followed along so far, you press it again. Okay.
All right, we're getting to 15, hopefully so. And if not, maybe it's a good time to just pause for a minute. Let's see. Sure. I don't see any questions on Slack. Again, if there's any problem, please post. As was expressed before, if you have a particular question, chances are more people have the same question. So really feel free to, uh, to ask. Okay, we've been stuck on 14 for a while. Um, maybe we should move on. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, these are two functions defining the uh, prior and likelihoods. So now we can define our posterior. Um, because the posterior is the product of the prior and likelihoods. So if you take the logarithm, it'd be the sum of the log uh, of prior and log likelihoods. So here are two functions defining the log posterior uh, for flat prior and for peak prior. So the difference is the prior we use, the likelihood is the same. Um, so it also takes in three arguments. The two of the arguments are fixed and the only change, changing one is the theta here. <laughs> okay, um, so now I think we can uh, create some fake experimental data and do our Bayesian, Bayesian analysis. So suppose we have um, an experimental measures Y and it's reported by a mean value and uncertainty value, uh, like I just mentioned. Um, in this notebook, we just use one data point, which is the uh, assuming to be the mean and the uncertainty. Um, so the, the experimental data mean is 0 0.09 and uncertainty is 0 0.01. And then, um, so here we are using MCMC to sample from the posterior. Um, but uh, so there are a lot of MCMC packages on, uh, in Python. The one we use is the, the one called MC. Um, this works well for our simple problem, but there are also some more uh, sophisticated uh, algorithms for estimating posterior, such as the parallel temp MCMC, tempered MCMC. Um, so this, I, I believe it will be uh, discussed by way out tomorrow. So for now, let's just use this MC package in Python. Okay, so let me first get it to run because it might take two minutes or so. Okay, so this code chunk is, doing, uh, is generating samples from uh, using MCMC. Um, so prior to run the MCMC sampler, we have to set a few parameters. So this has parameters we need to set. First one, ending is the number of a number of parameters in the model. So in our simple problem, it's just one. Uh, and the second, end workers. So this means how many chains we want uh, for running the MCMC. Um, here we set it to be 20. So the idea of using multiple chains is to, um, uh, so you can initialize different chains at different positions and let it run for a lot of iterations. 
to see whether the ending position is uh, around the same. So if they are not the same, it means the chains have not converged. But if they uh, all fall within the same area, that may suggest your chain have converged. But there are also some other diagnostics you need to check um, just to assess whether NCMC samples have converged. <laughs> so that's the first two um, settings. The last three are the ones uh, Simon just mentioned in the slides. Let's recap a bit. Okay, so we have this burn-in period, and we also have this uh, thinning step. So the first parameter, n burn, is the, num uh, the number of iterations uh, for the burn-in period. So we will discard all the, uh, the first 1,000 iterations. n steps uh, means the production uh, iterations after the burning period is finished. So after this 1,000 steps, we will uh, run another 2,000 iterations. And thin means the thinning intervals. We keep only uh, uh, one iteration out of five iterations here. So that's the five parameters. And then um, these two lines is to initialize our chain. So as I just said, we have 20 chains and we want to initialize uh, them in different positions. So that's uh, why we want to set starting guesses. Um, so this is uh, uh, random starting guesses just within the range of the theta the parameter. And then, um, so let's ignore these two lines, just printing some information. Um, so the key function in this MC package is this ensembler, ensemble sampler. So it's using um, some, uh, okay, I didn't mention here. It's using some, some sort of uh, MCMC sampler called affine transform sampler, affine sampler, uh, affine invariant ensemble sampler. Yeah. Um, so it takes in four arguments, or there are a lot of uh, arguments you can tune uh, to make the uh, MCMC performance better. But here we're just using the uh, most important four. First one, number of chains you want and workers. Second, number of it, uh, dimension of the parameter uh, ending. Third one, your target distribution you want to sample from. Um, so for the first part, we sample the uh, posterior using the flat prior. And uh, this argument is just the ad additional arguments for this post uh, posterior distribution. So we need to input experimental data, experimental uncertainty. <coughs> okay. And then uh, we first run the MCMC uh, for the burn-in period. So the length is M burn, and the starting position is starting guesses. So this contains 20 chains, uh, each from its different initialization points, and run a thousand iterations. And then we reset the sampler because we need to run the production sampling period. This line is running, uh, so after the burn-in period, we keep running the chain for 2,000 more iterations. And we also uh, thin the chain by uh, five, in, uh, five steps in an interval. <coughs> so the final uh, samples and some other information are stored in this sampler flat prior uh, arc object. Um, and then we can just uh, reshape this uh, samples because we, we have 20 workers, meaning 20 chains, and uh, each chain is run for 2,000 steps and same by uh, five steps. So we want to combine uh, the samples of 20 chains and uh, put it as the final posterior samples for our uh, first prior, the flat prior. So this code chunk is for sampling the posterior with a flat prior. <laughs> and then we do the same for the peak prior so the only change here is instead of using the log posterior flat prior, we are using the log posterior pick prior. And everything is the same. So after two minutes or so, you, are, you should be able to finish the runs. And let me just pause here to see if everyone can follow along or is there any issue when running the code.
Nothing on Slack. I see 10 green checks. Uh, maybe let's just wait to 1127. Sorry, I was talking and then I realized I was muted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so if you're uh, if you're not yet uh, caught up, uh, remove your green check mark, and if you're up to speed, then put a green check mark. Shall we wait for one more minute or just continue? Somebody has posted an error message on Slack, so maybe oh. uh, we'll give them some opportunity to work through that. Mm -hmm. It might be the case if you are using a different uh, version of NC. Double object doesn't have attribute calls. Um, has anyone else encountered this issue? I'm guessing it might be something. Okay. No. Errors. I mean, it could be a version problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have five green uh, green check marks. Uh, so that does mean that people are being held up in some way. Six now. So if you have a uh, a similar problem, uh, just maybe reply to the to the chat in in Slack. Uh, maybe we get a, a sense of the scale of the problem. What version of I'm I'm posting my question for the folks who are encountering the error. So for Hendrik and William, are, can you just type in what what version you you're using, and then maybe we can. No, oh, inside the Jetscape container. No, that should that should be fine. And so, Irene, are you working inside the Jetscape container, or? Um, no, I'm just using my own uh, Python. Okay, so that. So there may, there may be a mismatch between um, your version and the one inside the container. I'll check something. I think Derek Soder mentioned a solution that folks can try out. Uh, it's in Slack. 
Yeah, just a diagnostic. Um, could you try running that too, Irene, uh, to see what your version okay. is and compare? Thanks. Uh, 3.0.2. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody posted it's uh, two to one in two to one in the chat skip printing. Yeah. Okay, that might be the issue. So I think Chun has posted instructions to update. Keep us updated if uh, the upgrade works. Okay, so I guess install uh, upgrading the MC package will work. Okay, yeah, so if you're yeah. working on this, sorry, go ahead, Ron. Oh, no, I'm just commenting. That's good. Yeah, yeah, so Chun has, in, has some more instructions posted now in uh, this thread, and uh, Derek also has a uh, useful comment. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, let's uh, pause for a few more minutes. Let's see if uh, uh -huh. at least um, some of the people can overcome this. Percentage wise, how far are you uh, through the uh, through what you wanted to present, Irene? Just um, to get a sense for how much time we still need. I think uh, because the last part is just replication of the first, so uh, the last part shouldn't take so long. So I guess uh, fifteen to twenty minutes should be sufficient. Okay. Okay. So green check marks have been going up slightly. I hope that's a good sign. Okay, yes, so we got some feedback that the upgrade works. So if you have uh, the same problem, maybe you will look at the solutions that were posted. Of course, if you have a different problem, please post that one too. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, nine green check marks, excellent.
Okay. Yeah, we're getting more and more success messages. We're up to 11. Maybe another minute or so, and then we can move, probably move on. Okay. Okay, the counter hasn't been moving in a while now, so maybe we'll move on. Uh, I hope everybody can, who still wants to catch up, can catch up. And uh, if, again, if any other problems occur, please post on uh, Slack. All right, Irene, why don't we move on? Okay, sure. Um, so after uh, drawing the samples from the, the two posteriors, uh, we also need to check whether the chains have converged uh, and whether the uh, samples are representative of our posterior. Um, so there are a lot of uh, MCMC diagnostics which can be found in different uh, Python modules. Um, so feel free to explore them later. Uh, there are this ARBIZ or PyMC3 and some others. So here we're just using a very simple visualization um, of the samples. So these are the two trace plots um, coming from the first log posterior and the second log posterior. Um, so um, the thing to check the trace plot is to see whether um, Let's use this one as an example. So here we see two different types of trace plots. Um, we call this uh, good mixing and there's a bad mixing. Um, so we see in this figure, the trace, uh, the points are moving quite rapidly uh, around this, uh, the truth I hear here. <laughs> but for this one, it's moving up slowly towards uh, some target. So this is not perform performing well in terms of the uh, MCMC convergence. And this trace plot shows the uh, samples are exploring the posterior uh, rapidly, which is a good thing. So we, we think these two uh, figures all fall uh, onto this category, not this one. So we don't see any issue with our um, trace plots. And if you want, you can also do some other diagnostics, which I won't recover here. Um, so after um, all this uh, diagnostics and the sampling, we can now po uh, plot our posteriors. Um, so here we are just doing some uh, density plots of the, um, the posterior flat prior and posterior pick prior. Okay, um, so uh, here on x-axis, we have our parameter range. And on y-axis, so this is the density of our posterior samples. <laughs> um, the blue one is the uh, posterior using the flat prior, and the, and the red one is the posterior using the pick prior. 
So this may answer your question uh, regarding whether um, the prior will have an impact on the posterior sampling. So uh, when we have only one data point, uh, the prior will have much have a lot of impact on the posterior sampling. So we see this blue one is more spread out than the red one because the original prior for this blue one is just um, a flat uh, uniform distribution. But as we uh, have more and more data, um, the impact of prior will reduce gradually. But so far, we just use one data point, so we, we will see such behavior. <laughs> um, so just some exercise to uh, maybe just to uh, try to draw some conclusions from this figure and try to play with some other parameters um, in the previous codes and see uh, what's the performance of the MCMC sampler. Okay, so uh, after plotting the posterior samples of the uh, parameters, we also we also want to plot our posterior predictive distribution. So the meaning is um, after we have all the samples of theta, we want to know if we use this theta to do predictions, what's the final output? <laughs> so what we do here is to uh, run this emu predict function on uh, the posterior samples of theta. So we have two sets of data, so we can run the prediction twice and plot them together. This figure um, shows the posterior sample, uh, posterior predictive distribution of uh, two different post, uh, two different prior, flat prior and peak priors. We also plot the uh, the true experimental data and its uncertainty uh, in this green band here. Um, so we do see um, like half or more than half of the case, uh, we, we have good alignment between the experimental data and also our posterior predictive samples. But again, because we only have one data point, so it cannot constrain the parameters so well. Okay, uh, is everyone following along for now? before we go to the last section. <laughs> Let me check if there's any question on Slack. Yeah, nothing on Slack right now. Okay. So maybe let's go on with the last section. Um, so the last section is um, just to serve as a validation of our posterior samples. Um, so let's come back to the slides. Here, here. Um, so we say our target posterior is using the simulator um, to uh, do Bayesian parameter estimation. And because of the simulator is extensive, we replace it by the emulator. But in our notebook, just this simple exercise, our simulator is not extensive at all. So we can actually use the simulator to sample from the target posterior distribution. And that's what we are doing in the last section. To serve as, as a validation and checking for our um, emulation and uh, MCMC procedure. Um, so first we define our likelihood using the simulator. So that's basically the function uh, the, the expression I just showed you. Um, again, three arguments, uh, but the calculation is a bit different, especially for the uh, sigma square. And instead of using the emulator to do predictions, we can now just run the simulator, the lean model itself. And then again, after we update our likelihood function, we can update our posterior distribution. Um, so we append the name uh, simulator uh, in the two names for the log posterior distribution and replace uh, the likelihoods using emulator by likelihoods using simulator. Uh, and then just run MCMC. So there's nothing new, just replacing the target posterior um, to be the one uh, using the simulator instead of the emulator. Um, so in practice, uh, you won't be able to do this step because of the uh, because the simulator are just too expensive. But for our uh, simple uh, simplified exercise, we can do such um, sampling. 
and it's very fast because we are just using a linear model. <coughs> so finally, we just plot the party posterior and compare against the posterior using the emulator. This is one way to assess better our uh, previous procedures for emulation and for MC, MC samplings are uh, making sense. Okay, um, so the first figure shows the party posterior versus the posterior using GP emulator with the flat prior. And the figure on the right shows the, um, the one using the pick prior. Um, so we do see there's a better alignment between the target posterior and our posterior with GP emulator for the peak prior. This also confirms uh, the fact that because we only have one data point, uh, the, the prior will have dominance uh, information uh, on the posterior. So this one, uh, when we change the likelihoods to be the, the one using simulator, there might be a little bit difference here. But of course, when you run the, uh, the notebook for multiple times, there, are, there will be different uh, behaviors and different patterns. But uh, I think they still uh, show overall good alignment between uh, the target and the posterior we sampled using the GP emulator. <laughs> so any questions so far? And we've reached to the end of the hands-on sessions. Let's check the okay. All right, so any questions? Maybe we should uh, have one last round of green dots, just indicating who has made it all the way to the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if, you're, if you've been successful, give us a green check mark. If not, if you're still working on it. And uh, okay, 12, that's great. Okay, so I guess the Slack channel will stay open anyway. Um, if there's any follow-up questions, there were exercises um, that you can do. Uh, so playing around with everything, right? So mm -hmm. um, if there's any questions that come while you do that, I think you can still post them on Slack and somebody is going to answer. Okay, and that's the end of the hands-on session. All right. Well, thank you, Irene. Thank you. Last opportunity for questions. If not, uh, Chun, should we close? Yeah.